Hello, everybody, and welcome to this wonderful discussion. Um, I am June Sarpong, and I'm so thrilled and honored uh, to be in conversation uh, with one of our national heroes, perhaps one of the main heroes of 2020, uh, Patrick Hutchinson. Hi, Patrick. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> hi, June. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know, my name is June Sarpong. Uh, I am a broadcaster, a campaigner. Uh, I have been in television for over 20 years. Um, and I'm one of those people that is so passionate about diversity and inclusion. And over the past few years, I've written a few books uh, on this uh, particular topic and have a new one out at the moment called The Power of Privilege. Uh, and the reason why uh, I'm the lucky person that gets to be in conversation with Patrick uh, is because he also has a new book that's coming out, I hear, first week of November, right, Patrick? Uh, and it is Everyone Versus Racism. A Letter to My Children, and a book that we all need to read, particularly now with everything uh, that is going on. And um, Patrick, what I'd love us to do is, we all know the moment, the moment that really made you uh, a national hero and a national superstar. But can you tell me a bit about your life before that? Because what makes your story so inspiring and so fascinating and just mind-blowing is how doing the right thing can literally change your life overnight so give us the life before that well you know, hi again june it's, uh, Hello, it's a privilege to, to to spend this time on a one-to-one -one basis talking to you and everybody on facebook live um so a bit about me before this uh, my life has been like changed um i was a uh, personal trainer and a uh, athletics coach so i work a lot with children and young mm. adults mm -hmm. and prior to that i worked up in the city for 25 years in uh, it sort of in mm. the infrastructure side of things yes. uh, for various investment banks mm. so i've sort of seen you know sort of both sides of uh, the spectrum so to speak in terms of having a job that uh, you just do for the money and having a job that you actually do for the love you know so yeah. i've seen both sides of that yeah um and yeah so prior yeah so prior to that i was just an ordinary ordinary father ordinary grandfather you know help looking after his children help look after his grandchildren um coaching mentoring and doing all that good stuff well grandfather is the bit we don't believe i mean <laughs> Can you, if we, let's just be superficial for a minute before we get all deep, because this chat's going to be deep. But how are you a grandfather? <laughs> what What is your fitness regime in that you look so young? You look, I bet you your kids, people think you're your kids' friends more than their, their, their father, let alone grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my 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 daughter, she's like the twenty five, and um, mm. what, what, one of my daughters, shall I say, my oldest daughter, and when she first had, um, you know, our, her, you know, my grandson Theo, and we used to go out together. I used to get these looks, like you know, like she's a bit young for you, isn't she? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, walking around with her, so that was that was funny. But yeah, no, I mean, I just um, I just uh, try and eat well, uh, try and. Uh, drink a lot of water i'm still working on that one mm. i work out quite a lot but not as much as you might think mm -hmm. um and um that's basically it i, I stay I, away from sugar um yeah. and i don't i don't drink alcohol you know i don't have any i don't take any recreational type of drugs or anything <laughs> so, so yeah you know my my drug is uh working out and and i bet you also keeping a positive mindset too is that is that part of your sort of daily routine as well yeah, yeah, I try to uh, maintain a, you know, a positive outlook on life. You know, like when you wake up in the morning, the fact that you've woken up um, and you, all your limbs, are, you know, appear to be working and you seem to be able to see and smell and speak, you should be grateful that you're one I of the agree. many that, that were able to wake up this morning because there are yeah. many that, that can't do all the things that we can do and there are many that haven't even woken up this morning. Yeah. So and you that... have to try and... Yeah, yeah. So you have to kind of live a, a half full, full type life, you know. Look on the positive. 
I agree, particularly in an, in an era where we are going through a pandemic, where that is even more pronounced in terms of there are people who will not wake up today. So if yeah. you are one of the lucky ones to even not just wake up, but to wake up with your health, that in yeah. itself is so much to be grateful for. So can yeah. you take us back to that moment earlier this year where your life literally changed overnight? So I hear that you weren't even sure about going down to the protest to, because so yeah. tell us about the reason why you wanted to go and the fact that you almost didn't go. Can you talk about that a bit? So the reason the, the guys and I wanted to go was because, um, you know, one of us, uh, Jermaine uh, Facey, one of the, the, the four members of UKI, mm. uh, he had been down previously to the uh, demonstration where the, the, the policewoman had, had failed, was, was failed from her yeah. horse. Yes. Um, and he, when he went down there, he saw there were no uh, elder, wiser members of the community over, overseeing the children and the, mm. and the younger adults, you know, yes. who were there protesting. And he just felt like, you know, where, where were we? So I think on the way, you know, when he came back, he, he sent out, he did a few lives on Insta and Facebook and stuff, sort of uh, calling out, you know, all the fathers and uh, the elder people from the community, especially those who are trained and, and who are, you know, who have the knowledge and understanding of how to, you know, help keep uh, crowds calm under situations and stuff. You know, where were we all? Um, and so, you know, him, along with uh, another friend of mine, Pierre Noah, they decided to try and get as many of us together as possible to go down there for the next um, protest, you know, protests, which happened to be the one where uh, there were going to be some anti, uh, um, anti Black Lives Matter protesters there. Mm. So, so yeah, that's, that's sort of how it originally transpired. And, 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 so, and, and then the morning of you weren't, you almost didn't go. Is that right? Yeah. The morning of I was, I was looking after Theo and Asia, two of my grandchildren, mm. um, and I'd promised to do that. And um, <laughs> yeah, I really didn't want to leave them because they hadn't seen me for quite a bit. And mm. I was with them and we were hanging out and stuff and chilling. Uh, but, it, you know, there was a greater calling, <laughs> you know, and in the end, you know, I had no choice really but to go because, um, you know, we knew that the, the, the numbers are really low. That was one of the main reasons. Had there been more people that were going to go down there in the first place, then I would have probably taken a back seat and said, you know what, I'll, I'll sit this one out. I'll sit this one out. But wow. because there was, the numbers were so low, there was like about, I think, five or six of us that, you know, were going to go down there on the day. Yeah. I was obligated to go. Yeah. You had no choice but to try no, and I had be no, a force I had, for good. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so you get to the protest it, we see, we've seen all the images in terms of what happened that day. Um, and then you see this man on the floor who was from the other side, perhaps one of the uh, people that were anti uh, the BLM uh, movement. And your natural instinct was to protect him. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, you know, we'd seen from afar that he, he, you know, his life seemed to be a little bit in danger. And there were some protesters that were there trying to protect him, trying to stop harm, harm coming, coming to him. But you could see very quickly that more and more people had realized that he was like, a, you know, a, oh. a lone, uh, a lone yes. ranger all by yeah. himself. And, yeah. you know, quickly, very quickly, um, you know, people you know what the numbers doubled and trebled and it got really really hectic so we rushed over there to try and try and help protect him because the few that were protecting him they didn't they, you know time wasn't on their side mm. um you know the guys they you know they're literally throwing people out of the way to get to him to try and mm. get to get to this guy and then i was the last one in and i, I just picked him up and, and put him on my shoulder and just walked him out i had no um no one said to do it or anything it just seemed to be the natural the right thing at the time, because, um, you know, you have to think oh, so it's quick, it's quick on your feet. And, you know, the only way for to get out of there safely, not just him, but us too, because we would all been trampled eventually. Yeah. Just to, just to pick him up and march him out of there. Wow. And, and have you stayed in touch with him? What was that moment like for both of you? Well, I mean, I, I haven't heard anything from, from, uh, that man, um, okay. since it happened. Um, and I, so I don't really know much okay. uh, from his perspective. 
Mm-hmm. But um, obviously, from my perspective, it's uh, turned my life it was, upside down. It was the right thing to do. So let's talk yeah. about. So let's talk about the book. So everyone versus racism: a letter to my children. What is it that you want people to take from this book? I want people to sort of uh, maybe sort of look into my life a little bit, see how I was raised. Um, mm. And as a young um, black boy to uh, to a black man, try and maybe understand what it's like to sort of be in someone of, you know, my shoes and, and any other black male mm. person's shoes or black person's shoes growing up in this country. Um, that's kind of what I want people to take from it. So, so you know, similar to your book where you, you want people to understand what racism is about and what, what un- unconscious bias actually means and what systemic mm. racism actually means. I want people to sort of, you know, sort of travel in my, in my shoes a little bit and see what it was like um, so that maybe they will understand at the end of it and, um, and sort of get it a little bit more, you know? Um, yeah. And in the, in, the, in the process, you know, telling a few anecdotes of my story, my life, um, there's some, there's a few, there's a few factual bits and bobs in there, some statistics and stuff, which are, you know, always good to sort of, you know, nail home various um, point. points that you're trying yeah. to make. Mm-hmm. And but at the end of it all, I want people to sort of come away with a feeling that, do you know what, like, you know, if we all come together as a society and as individuals and do better and create a better world for our children. Completely. And also, do you know what I love about what you've been able to do, um, which I haven't seen done perhaps enough in the UK, there's more of this in America than here, um, is to really explain the black British male experience. Um, Because that is an identity that I don't think gets enough attention and gets enough um, attention. a sort of analysis in terms of what that experience is and so I just want to thank you for for doing that because I think it's it's so important for people to understand that yeah I, I think that you know as black people across the world we we've all had um you know experienced racism of but course. ultimately our experiences are all different yeah you know in America here Brazil, Australia, wherever you are, your experience is different. Yeah. Um, but it all mounts to the same thing. Yeah, in the end. And so can you tell us why you chose Sophia Tacker, the, the, the poet, the extraordinary young voice, um, to, to help you co-write the book? What, what, what was that process like, working with someone who is actually a poet as opposed to a sort of um, a, a traditional sort of uh, prose or, or non-fiction writer? Well, there was a few, um, you know, young, really upcoming black writers mm. that were, you know, put to me. So I did a little bit of research on on every and everybody, but but Sophia just blew my mind. Um, you know, I went on her website, watched some of her spoken word footage, um, did as much, you know, did a lot of stuff, research on her, and it just, it just, she just blew blew me away with her, her spoken word, uh, the, you know, the poems, the actual poems. And then obviously the final thing was meeting her. Yeah. And then that and that was it. And because she's a very similar age to my daughter. Yeah. It really resonated with me. It was almost like talking to my daughter. Mm-hmm. Um and she's a very smart, very bright, very intelligent girl, just like my daughter is. And and it just felt like I was I was it was like my daughter helping me write a book. Amazing. And that was the the final thing. And also because I also did want to have that input from the younger generation. Obviously, I'm the older generation, so my input's already in the book. But mm. having her input sort of hopefully, hopefully spans across the generation, the generation so that the younger yeah. and the older generation can can both uh, enjoy it. Yeah, and take something from it. Amazing. Uh, so tell me more about, you touched on it, but tell me more about Yutkai. Am I saying it right, Utkai? How do I say it? Um, so so we, we pronounce it without, we, 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 we call it a silent T. So we call it Yukai. You guys, um, so tell me, so but, tell but me if more you didn't know that. that, you, yeah, so it stands for United to Change and Inspire, right? Mm-hmm. And um, we have so many different um, explanations as to why we use that that name. Um, I have my explanation centers around us being united as, uh, you know, concerned parents 
uh, going down there on the day to oversee our, our young, uh, sometimes more volatile you know, protesters. Um, and then we, um, we changed the narrative because there's a ne negative stereotype of, of us as people, and especially the black man. There's a, there mm. are some, some negative stereotypes out there. And we like to think that we've changed that narrative um, mm. by doing what we did. And yep. um, we're trying to inspire everybody else to, to just be like us, you know, and, and do the same. Fantastic. <laughs> so that, that's my, um, my explanation. But we have a lot more different explanations as to why those three words really resonated with all, with all of us as a group. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. There's a quote from the book, which I love, uh, where you say, it's not black versus white, it's everyone versus racism. And, and that's what it has to be, isn't it? It has to be in the end, everybody, whether you're impacted by it or not, deciding this is not good enough for our society. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, I remember on the day when it, you know, when the picture and the video footage first went viral and it was sent to me and then I posted it on my Instagram page and I, and I thought, what could I write? What could you, what, what could you write? And I, it just came to me. I just thought, it's not black v white, it's everybody versus the racists. So I wrote mm. the racists down at the time. And then it's since evolved into racism because obviously mm. that is a much broader spectrum. So, so yeah, <laughs> and, and who, and who would have thought when I, when I, um, when I wrote that at the time that, you know, four months down the line or whatever, five months down, I'd have a book with that title. That's just and like that, it, and that you managed to get it out so quickly. That's the yeah. other bit that's impressive. And I yeah. love that the opening image is the, is the image itself. Let me move it this way so you can see it better in the camera. But I think what a powerful image to start with that whenever yeah. anybody opens the book, this is yeah. what they see. And, and, and that is exactly what you are doing here is demonstrating the title of this book to say no. Yeah. We plan to do things differently. For us, this is about inclusion, not exclusion. Yeah. So yeah. bravo to you. Um, before we go into the conversation uh, to talk about uh, my book, I want to ask you about a certain somebody you've been hanging out with this week, uh, Prince oh. Harry, <laughs> hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, that was for the GQ heroes or the GQ yeah. honors. Tell yeah. me about that. I mean, and it was such a lengthy, detailed conversation. It was beautiful. Tell me more. I mean, it, it didn't feel lengthy. The guy is so down to earth. He's so chill, yes. so cool. That it Lovely felt, guy. It felt like uh, it didn't feel as long as it, as it was. I could have spoken to him for a couple of hours, to be honest. He was, it was a real honor to, to speak to him. Um, like I said to him at the time, like my mum uh, absolutely adored his mother. Yeah. Um, and uh, when, you know, when she passed, um yeah it was, it was almost like she lost a personal friend you know yeah. <laughs> it was you know and i know that she had that effect on a lot of people lot diana of people. princess diana yeah. she was a wonderful so um woman. so to speak to to you know to one of her children it was like yeah it was amazing but yeah no you know i hope to get the opportunity to hang out with him you know properly one day you know who knows <laughs> yeah i'm sure you will i'm sure you'll be on a, a flight to uh a la sooner than you think <laughs> Brilliant. So it'd be great for us to talk in terms of some of the, the work around power of privilege. I, I, I know that you were yes. you received it yesterday. It'd be great to get, hear some of your thoughts and any questions you might have for me. Yeah, well, um, I've got a few questions. I mean, I did get to, to digest quite a bit of it, believe it or not. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to give away uh, anything because obviously <laughs> people then won't buy it if we give it all away now right <laughs> exactly. but, but, the, but I would say the the story about um the prices and Reggie really touched mm. me oh beautiful yeah? isn't it so, yeah. um, if people want to know about that story then you need to get the book <laughs> <laughs> exactly if you want to know then you need to get it totally yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um but but yeah there's a there's a lot of really really good um you know information in this book so i would definitely recommend anyone anyone buy it <laughs> so in terms of um some questions so i have um one for you um yeah. so obviously you've written this book mm. and but i don't know how many people know this but you've obviously this is your third book yes 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. you're like, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're experiencing the game of uh, <laughs> writing books, you know. A little bit now. And yeah. I don't, and I don't hear anything about you having any ghostwriters. So, like, <laughs> no, <this> is, <laughs> not, <this> not is... <laughs> on the, not on these ones. But I'm the next one. I think just because of time, I think I'm gonna yeah. have to. But yeah, on these ones, I've written them all myself. But the next yeah. lot, I think I'm gonna have to for time. <laughs> but you know, the so, thing was, sorry, go on. I was, I was, I was gonna, I was just gonna say. So I know I can see you're a, a super smart woman. So I was gonna say, um, you know, what inspired you to write to 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 begin writing in the first place? Like, yeah. why did you start writing books? Um, and um, you know, have you got any more planned? I mean, this is number yeah. three. Like, like <laughs> yeah, you know, what else? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing, Patrick, in a way, it sort of feeds into what you were just saying. So my first book diversify and that's a that's a big book um and and that was all about um the social moral and economic benefits of diversity and inclusion looking at various um uh, underrepresented or discriminated against groups so i i was looking obviously uh, at gender within the context of race as well um i looked at disability uh, LGBTQ plus class, um, uh, all of the sort of key main groups that we discriminate against in society. And what happened was um, it then became the kind of tool that lots of workplaces used for their diversity and inclusion. And the reason why I decided to write the first book was because I was filming, as you know, I've been in, in television a very long time and I was filming in America and a young man appeared on set who had tattoos and you know i made up in my head all these assumptions about who he is or who he was or who i thought he was and and you know don't forget patrick i grew up like you in east london i grew up uh, on a council estate so it wasn't as if i wasn't used to men like him I just wasn't used to men like him in that context. And even though I'd been campaigning in my industry that it needed to be more inclusive, actually when the status quo was challenged, even I sort of had to adjust to it. And it's the thing that I know that you as a, as a black man will understand when people perhaps are immediately fearful of you for no reason because of the package that you appear in. And this is something that I'd, I had always sort of campaigned against. But when I found myself doing it myself, I was like, oh my God, oh my gosh. this is what it is. When somebody meets someone that they perceive as different to themselves and that wall goes up and that disconnect sets in. And, and, and as a black woman, as a working class black woman, I know what that feels like when people do it to me. And I thought, my God, this is what it is, wow. And then I also thought, wow, if even I am having this reaction to this young man, what chance has he got of really making it in our industry? And that's what made me want to figure out how to start a conversation around these very uncomfortable issues that we have to address in order to move society forward. So that was the genesis of Diversify. Um, and so I wrote the book and was going all around the country and in fact, around the world, uh, talking to audiences about how to be more inclusive, et cetera, et cetera, and the benefits. And a lot of my audiences mainly were all white audiences. And the thing that would constantly happen is white people would keep coming up to me, particularly on race, because often race is the one people avoid, whereas I wasn't avoiding it. I was talking right. about it and in a way that perhaps they felt they, they could engage with. And so they would come and ask, you know, we want to know how to be better allies. I'm scared of saying the wrong thing, getting it wrong. What can I do? And I, and I thought, you know what? There needs to be a book specifically on the to-dos because there'd been some fabulous books about the issues and the historical context, but there wasn't enough of sort of the prescriptive nature of things, which is what can you actually do if you want to be an ally and if you want to be an agent of change? Um, so I'd started writing it. 
I'll be honest, the publishers weren't so sure at the time. Um, and then, <laughs> and then obviously the events of the past few months happened. And it was like, oh, do you remember that book you were writing before? I was like, yes. And they're like, well, perhaps <laughs> now is the time for it. Um, yeah. And then obviously we updated it and added all of the sort of social context of the moment that we're in. Um, and so that's how it came about. But it's a very practical book. It's very small, as you can see. Um, but it's all about the to do's. If you want, thank you, darling. And um, if you want to be an ally, if you want to create change, um, there are real tools on how to do that. And I think particularly at work, I think for many people of color, you know, the stuff that gets all of the attention on the news is all being stopped by the police or whatever, but actually where we really feel it is often in the workplace, where yeah. we really come into the sort of reality of that this is not a level playing field. When you see colleagues that started after you uh, passing you in terms of um, seniority and promotions. Yeah. You know, when you see you're not being paid the same, when you see how perhaps you're talked over in meetings and all of that stuff, that is really where we experience this. And yeah. and, and then how that impacts us in the home and, 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 and obviously how that impacts us socially as well. So for me, I really wanted to be able to address those issues uh, for particularly white people, uh, particularly actually, because actually when it comes to positions of power, because society isn't fair, it's mainly white men uh, that are in positions of power. Um, so really showing those that want to be allies how to how to do it effectively. Yeah, no, that um, I can really resonate, especially with that last bit, um, because uh, like, like, like me as an individual, I... I decided to just up and leave the city, right? And a lot of us do decide to do that, but we're never gonna change the city if we all up and if we all run away. Yeah. So so you need to uh, stick around, but we need change so that they, people will stick around, you know? Yeah, um, and, all, cause every... and, and also just to add to that, I think, you know, you decided to leave the city. Lots of people have decided to leave my industry. Lots of people have decided to leave other industries for the same reason. Because yeah. after a while, you have to make the choice of your mental well being or yeah. being somewhere where you're going to be so frustrated because yeah. you know you're not being treated the same. And it's, yeah. a, and it's a horrible decision to have to make, but that's the decision that many people of color find themselves in in the workplace. And it is, and, and like for me, I mean, I was, I think I, I was earning like nearly five times less as a personal trainer than I was working in, earning in the city. Wow. So fin financially, it, you know, caused a real problem for me. Yeah. But that being said, I was still happier. Yes. <laughs> having no money, yeah. but, working with the but working with the children, yeah. Then, you know, having all this money and working in the city. So that just yeah. tells you, you know, your mental well-being, you know, counts for a lot. And money is just not everything. No, it's you know? every, it, your mental well-being and your well-being in general is In general, is yeah. Yeah, and you is know everything, what? yeah. And you know what else to that point, uh, Patrick, that I love about your story, which I just... I tell you, I just love your story. Your story is going in my next book, just so you know. Um, is <laughs> is how a moment can change your life. Because, you know, I, obviously I don't want to get into your, your personal circumstances, but I can imagine if you've gone from earning a, a six-figure salary to earning a fraction of that, the stress that puts on your family and particularly you're a, you're a proud man, you're a family man, you are someone I, I can imagine has provided for your family your whole life. You're probably the one in the family everybody comes to for advice and so on. So the, 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 the stress that that puts you under, even if you are now in a profession that's much more fulfilling personally, you still have yeah. all of those other issues to contend with. Yeah. And, and to, to think that, you know, one day, changes all of that overnight and and then justifies that very difficult decision you made giving yeah. up this security to follow your passion i mean it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean if there's ever a i mean i 
sometimes I did wonder if good things good things do happen to good people, but like I could be testament to that now yeah. for anybody, you know. Yeah. Anyway, let me ask you another question, right? Please. So, um, my next question is centers around the time that you were um, given the the use of Victoria Beckham's uh, is it Instagram? <laughs> is it Instagram? Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, so so what was that like when you, you know, had the uh, did you have the full the full run of it like to do what you I want with? I did. Like, it was amazing. Wow. So basically, how it all came about is there was a campaign in America uh, called Share the Mic, uh, which was about uh, prominent white women uh, using their platform to give uh, and to shine a light on the work of um, equally prominent black women who perhaps hadn't gotten the sort of attention that white women get in society. Yeah. So, you know, it was about bringing together sort of fantastic women to support each other. And anyway, it was a huge success in the US. Um, and so uh, Vanessa Kingori, who's an amazing woman, who's the publisher of Vogue, uh, a wonderful black woman, um, and Stephanie Fair, who is the chairwoman of the British Fashion Council, uh, a fabulous white woman, uh, decided to come together and do the same over here. So anyway, so they emailed me and they were like, June, um, we're doing this thing called Share the Mic. Really love you to be involved. I didn't really know what it was, but whenever those two call you for anything, you don't say no. So I was like, anything for you two, especially Vanessa, who's a, a dear friend of mine. I was like, yeah, whatever you need, I'm in. They're like, it's on Instagram. I'm like, I haven't used Instagram in six years. I don't even know what my email is associated with it. I don't know the password. I don't know the phone number on that thing. How are we going to get into it? Anyway, Instagram managers sort it all out. And so I didn't really know how to use Instagram because I use Twitter and I don't even use Twitter that well. And Instagram's a lot harder. So then they're like, we found you. We know we now can tell you who we've decided to pair you up with. I'm like, who? They're like, Victoria Beckham. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm like the worst on Instagram. I cannot go and bring shame on Victoria Beckham's Instagram page. <laughs> so literally, God bless the HQ team. And Joe is watching this. She was amazing, as was my publisher, Lisa Milton. And they brought everybody from HQ together uh, to do some phenomenal um, um, work in terms of the visuals and so on. And then we brought someone else in who's like a social media whiz to curate it all. So the reason why, and I, if I do say so myself, and Victoria was very happy, may I add. Um, and I'm lucky in that I've known Victoria for a long time because I used to interview her a lot but i hadn't seen oh, her okay. in about a decade um right. but the reason why it looked so good was because we had a whole team do it and now if you look at my own instagram posts they're probably not the same standard <laughs> as that moment <laughs> yeah 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 but, but, but you're but obviously a lot more au okay with Instagram now though, okay, I guess. Ish, you know. ish, I'm getting there. But I want to be, like when I look at all of the young people who've got like really posh Instagram pages, I want to get up to that game and get my IG game on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, my, 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 my IG, I mean, Instagram for fitness professionals is a really, really good uh, marketing yeah. tool. Yeah. So my Instagram, you know, um, I'm not too bad on it, but Twitter, I mean, I've recently... Well, Twitter, you just joined, I saw. Yeah. Well, I, I, I've had the account, I've had the account for since 2010, right? Yeah. That's how long Does I've had the account. Me? But I've never used it. you so never used it. Recently, yeah. I've been told I need to start using it, but like, um, I, I'm not too sure with it. And it really scares me because you push something out there. I have no idea how to retract it if I get it wrong or whatever. So... I'm a bit nervous around Twitter. I think I need a bit of, uh, I need help. Coaching, you need coaching. Well, luckily yeah. our teams are on. But uh, but in a way, with what you're doing now in terms of your your social activism, uh, Twitter's definitely a great platform for that. So it's good that yeah. you're now doing it. And then obviously, with all your fitness, Insta is the place for that. And, and I yeah. hope you're going to be doing more on the fitness front. I was saying, I want you with vitamins and health oh, yeah, drinks gonna, and uh, shakes. Yeah. We need it all. I know I would I'm be signing up to buy uh, it. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on the moment on online content and live workouts and stuff like that. Brilliant. Um, I'm just trying to get the book out of the way because um, yeah. it's, you know, it's been my sort of uh, main thing. Your along baby. With my, my U, yeah, along with Yukai, because obviously I've got Yukai as well. Yeah. Member of that. And we're, we're doing lots of things with Yukai. So, 
I'm trying to fit the fitness in there still because that's my uh, my first love, as so to speak. Mm. You know, I love, and 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 obviously it helps me stay fit. If I can do live workouts with people, it will help me stay fit. Exactly, because now I'm not, finding I mean, the time to do it. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. So if I can stay fit and get paid for it in the process, it's a win-win for me, right? It's a win-win. <laughs> so when you were working in the city, were you somebody that was naturally active anyway? Were you somebody that loved yeah. fitness? Yeah, it was always, um, people always said to me, you know, why don't you think about becoming a personal trainer? Because you're mm. always working out, you're always, you're fit and stuff. And so, yeah, it was people that suggested it to me even though i'd been involved in martial arts and fitness throughout my whole life oh. um I, I i never saw it as a uh profession, profession to be honest yeah. it, was a, it was a it was the thing that kept me sane <laughs> yes yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah 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 brilliant i love it so no, so i have another another question for you june please right? so, go ahead <laughs> um so i know that you're uh a director at BBC, like you, creative diversity director. So you can sort of yes. tell me exactly what it is yes. that you do, and, and what's that like? What's it like having such a uh, a prominent role at the BBC, and um, and how long have you been doing it? Uh, November will be a year, uh, so I'm having my anniversary next month. It's my anniversary, um, and um, it's wonderful. You know, I've always been uh, in front of the camera. Um, so it's nice now to be behind the scenes uh, and hopefully um, being able to help uh, usher through a new generation of uh, diverse creatives um, yeah. and uh, also to be able to uh, challenge our teams um, to, to go that extra mile um, in terms of who is opportunity is given to um, and who we nurture and develop. Um, so it's, it's, it's an honor. And, you know, for, for ethnic communities, the BBC means so much to us, you know, for, for many of us uh, who, whose parents uh, are from the former colonies, the BBC plays such an important role in those countries. And, and even if you look at the World Service, the World Service is often the most listened to uh, radio uh, service in many of those countries. So for our communities, the BBC means so much. And perhaps in the past, the BBC hasn't um, um, adequately served our communities as well as they could have. Um, and I know that this is something that teams uh, uh, within the organization are really committed to doing. Uh, so to be able to to play any role in that is a, is a privilege and an honor. Okay, good, good. Yeah. And, and, are, and are they... Um, not trying to get you to call them out or anything, but are they, you know, behind the scenes? You know, what are they like? The diversity? Are they? Are they leading yeah. by example? Yeah, yeah. I think we were really seeing, wanting to be challenged and and find ways to to be much more inclusive. And the thing that's exciting is that the conversation happens at the start now of of all productions, as opposed to at the end, which is, oh my God, have we got enough? No. Now it's from the beginning. How do we make the whole process much more inclusive? So it's it's quite exciting. It's a really exciting time to be in our industry, I think. You know, when you think of how many um, creatives, much like we were talking about earlier, have left our industry or even in the way that you left the, the, the finance and, 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 and tech banking world, the same is true of my industry. So much yeah. talent has been missed and 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 not developed and and you know some have gone to other industries and some have gone to the states um, and yeah. i think that we will get to a place now where that talent doesn't have to leave to go to america just because they're not getting enough opportunity here if they are going to america it's in the way that white talent goes to america to get additional opportunity not that you're not getting any in your own country and so therefore you you have to leave um, so I think we're going to see uh, a shift, and I, and I'm really heartened by that. And that's an interesting comparison I, f I always find between the US and here, because obviously, you know, when it comes to law enforcement, things are uh, over there uh, like it's almost like they're, 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 it's they're backwards, you know. Mm. But then in other aspects, like you know, the ind various industries, they are ahead of us because. You have black people in such prominent positions and they've had a black president and and so there's there's uh it, it it's it's quite an interesting 
um, um, comparison. Comparison. That that, yeah, that, that, I, that in I some ways they're, they're much more forward than us, and other other ways we're behind them, and, and vice versa. Well, I completely think you're absolutely right, Patrick. And actually, it feeds into the title of your book in terms of everyone versus racism. I think the thing that we do better in the UK um, than anywhere in the Western world, anyway, um, is the integration piece in that because um, when immigrant communities came to the UK, they tended to move into white working class communities. And therefore, people sort of live side by side. Yes, you had white flight in some areas, but not to the extent of what you have in America. So we've all lived side by side if we're in diverse communities. And therefore, if you look at the rates at which we intermarry, the rates at which we sort of have friendships, we're much better at the integration piece. America is not so good at the integration piece, but they are much better at the opportunity piece in that yeah. because the American dream is the thing that fuels everything, no matter how much inequality and unfairness exists in that society, which it does, um, let's, let's not sugarcoat that in any way, you still have the American dream. So you get the extremes. So you get the Oprahs and the Barack Obamas, whereas here we have not done a very good job of the opportunity piece because we've tried to pretend that systemic racism doesn't exist. And at least in America, they admit it exists. Here, yeah, we try yeah. to pretend it doesn't. And so we've never done a good job at the opportunity piece. So you don't get those extremes. You know, you, you, you don't get, like it's terrible on, on the British rich list, I think there are two black uh, uh, men and there's one black woman out of a thousand people. I think yeah. there's a reason for that. And so yeah, once yeah. we're able to fix the opportunity piece, I believe we'll be ahead of everybody on this issue. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Totally agree mm. on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. I, I don't have any more questions for you. Um... Well, that's fine because we are <laughs> almost getting to the end of our conversation. I have a final question for you if that's okay uh, it's two okay. questions one is uh when is the book out do you know when it comes out it's november yep, it's, it's out date? november the 12th november the 12th is the day yep, um and the then the, and then the second is really is there any sort of past but fabulous like what you're doing there like, well I better join you <laughs> 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 Um, um, and then my final question, do you have any parting words for anybody that is watching? What is the thing that you want to leave everybody with? Um, for me, I just want um, society. I think that if we look deep enough within ourselves um, and we're honest, you know, like, um, I don't know about you, but I talk to myself a lot. Okay. So do I. <laughs> Always have. I talk to yeah. myself. Uh, and... Um, you can only have those honest conversations with yourself. Yes. And if you can have those honest conversations with yourself and, and say to yourself, you know, maybe there are uh, things about my character that I'm maybe not happy with, but I want to do better and I want to change. That's what we all need to do. And, yeah. and that's all of us, not, you know, that's every single body because we've all, like you mentioned earlier, we've all got these little prejudices and, you know, judgmental things about our, our, the way mm. we are that we yeah. can, you know, get rid of and eradicate. And ultimately we will have a, a better society for it, you know, yeah. if we just, we just do that, you know, and, and yeah. the other thing I like, always like to say is, um, how do you change the world? One um, random act of kindness at a time. If yes. we all did something, um, we all did something that was, that was nice and that was kind for somebody else. Um, not only would the world change overnight, but the feeling that you get, right? The endorphins you get from just seeing someone else be happy because of what you've done, yeah. that goes such a long way, you know? It's priceless. It's priceless. It's priceless, yeah. It really is. And also that, not that you would ever do it for selfish reasons, but that ra random act of kindness, as your story uh, so beautifully demonstrates, can also change your life for the better in ways that you can never imagine. Patrick, you could yeah. never have imagined this. Like, you, do you know what I mean? If a, yeah. if a year ago, at the beginning of the year, people, someone had come up to you and said, you know what, Prince Harry's going to be celebrating you. You'd be like, yeah, whatever. Like, do you see yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Sometimes 
life can dream a bigger dream than we could ever dream for ourselves and it's 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 yeah. beautiful yeah really i like that is. saying i like that yeah it really <laughs> is right it can yeah. it can dream yeah. a way bigger yeah. dream than we would have ever dreamed for ourselves so thank you for demonstrating that for us because considering what a tough year 2020 has been i think we needed to see something like this we needed to be able to see hope uh through some of the bleakness so i thank you um it's been an honor and a pleasure talking to you. Um, so excited to see all of the good things that are coming your way. Uh, so thank you so much, Patrick. Much and love to the you, family. Jean. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> and thank you all, everybody, for, for joining us uh, and being a part of this, this, this discussion. Um, have a great rest of the day, everybody. Uh, you know what to do. Make sure you stock up on these two fabulous books. Uh, they will be great reading uh, and lots of wisdom to be enjoyed and shared amongst your friends too. Uh, so take care, everybody. Patrick, what a pleasure. All my best. Bye-bye. Nice, nice to meet you, June. Bye. Likewise. Bye. Bye.